My Journey of Family Discovery Prologue Sometimes it takes a quirk of fate to discover a family story steeped in historical events. It was during genealogy research that the first hints of my ancestors being swept into the Kansas and Missouri border war appeared. At nine, I moved from Greenwood, Mississippi, to the plains of Kansas. Not knowing anything about Kansas, my learning about the state and its history was from a distinctly Kansas point of view. That history included the early struggles of Kansas territory and eventual statehood, the struggle between the factions of free state and pro-slavery. While learning of the bleeding Kansas period up through the Civil War and the violence committed on both sides of the divide, the education tilted towards the Kansas free state as the good and the Missouri pro-slavery as bad, and therefore, the listing of atrocities was one-sided. The Journey It was during the genealogy research being carried out by my sister that the first hints suggested that someone had bushwhacked my third great-grandfather, Benjamin Franklin Simpson. Slowly, we unveiled as many details as we could find. Benjamin was a farmer and a horse trader by profession. As the story has developed, Kansas Jayhawkers stopped him on January 1, 1862, near to his home. They intercepted him, along with several of his horses. Although no eyewitness account exists of what took place during that confrontation, the consensus is that he refused to hand over his horses, and the Jayhawkers subsequently took him captive. No documents listed him as a member of any pro-slavery groups or militias in the area which helped confirm the reputation of this group of jayhawkers as nothing more than a roving gang of ruffians who plundered and murdered. On January 2, 1862, he and a Mr. Grosshart, along with a third gentleman, were led into an open field approximately one mile north of the town of Dayton and executed by firing squad. This details the brutal ending for Benjamin and the beginning of great hardship for my third great-grandmother, Mildred, Millie, Simpson, and children. Two years later, the pro-union decree known as General Order No. 11 forced Millie and her family to leave their home. This decree forced the residents of Bates and the surrounding counties to leave their homes. As part of the decree, the authorities made the residents of the area declare their allegiance, either with the Union or the Confederacy. I can imagine after the murder of her husband two years earlier by pro-union forces, she replied, to hell with you. Millie and family packed their wagon and returned to the old homestead in Kentucky. In 1871, Millie and a portion of her children returned to the homestead in Bates County. They returned to a farmhouse and buildings burned to the ground by the Union soldiers. Millie rebuilt the farm and expanded it. Many mourned her death in 1901 as she was a highly respected member of the community. Events as they happened. My journey of family discovery begins 200 miles away from the events of 1862 in central Kansas. Haunted by the direction my family history was heading, my desire to see the sites where my family had experienced so much pain was ever growing. I read all the documents I had at hand, looking for every available detail. These documents, along with online maps, helped me pinpoint the hollow in which Benjamin's life so brutally ended. I already knew the location of Benjamin's grave, as my sister had visited his grave and Millie's grave a year before. I still did not know the location of the family homestead, but I was confident that looking through the records at the museum in Bates County, it was possible to find its location. My wife and I left for my journey of family discovery on a sunny Friday morning, as fate would have it. My wife's extended family live in and around Harrisonville, Missouri, a simple 20-minute drive from Dayton and the family homestead. The journey to my wife's aunt's house in Harrisonville was uneventful, but a feeling was creeping over me, a feeling best described as a sense of foreboding. I did my best to shake the feeling, but it followed me for the rest of the day even as we arrived at our weekend destination. Saturday morning, getting ready for the day, the sense of foreboding had dissipated. After breakfast, we climbed into the car for the short drive to the Bates County Museum. The countryside and miles to the museum passed quickly. 
A sense of sadness fell over me like a blanket as the turn to the museum approached. Upon arriving at the museum, we made a donation, and a museum volunteer greeted us. The volunteer assisted us in viewing the various Bates County record books and documents dating from the period that Millie had returned from Kentucky and rebuilt the homestead. We compared the layout from the old maps with modern maps of the area and could determine the exact location of the old family farm. As we drove the last mile down the gravel road towards our goal of the old family home, anticipation was building at what we might find. Would the old Rebuilt house still be standing, maybe an original barn? We came to a stop on the road in front of what I had so long wanted to see, the old Simpson homestead. I stared across the plowed field, and much to my disappointment in the 145-year history of the rebuilt farm, the original house and farm buildings were gone. As I stared in disappointment, a fog appeared across the landscape. Through the fog, I could just see a two-story plain white farmhouse. Outside of the farmhouse, I could make out the shapes of people moving about. A woman holding a toddler was standing just outside the front door. Several children appeared to be carrying clothing and furnishings from the house to a farm wagon. To the left of the family, mounted soldiers dressed in blue seemed to watch and not offering help as the family struggled to load the household furnishings. I strained my eyes to see faces, but the fog obscured the detail I so dearly wanted to see. I could feel the anger, the fear, the frustration of having yet one more indignity forced upon a family who only two short years before had lost a loving father to the bullets of a rogue firing squad. The image of the family forced to load their worldly possessions slowly faded away and replaced by the smoldering ruins of the house and outbuildings. I could smell the unmistakable odor of burning wood and grass. My wife must have touched my arm as I became aware of the shining sun in a field with nothing left. After a few moments, we started towards the next destination in my family history quest, my mind trying to process the images that had appeared before me. The gates of Crescent Hill Cemetery, our third stop on my journey of family discovery, appeared on our right. We pulled inside the gates and stopped for a moment, not realizing just how large the cemetery was going to be. We had an idea of where the grave we were in search of would be located. My sister had explained that the grave was located to the left of the entrance in an older part of the cemetery. Her information helped put us in the general location of the grave. It had taken 10 or 15 minutes of searching before my wife called to me, letting me know she had found it. I hurried over to the headstone she was pointing at and could barely make out the name as it was covered with lichen and 120 years of weather had softened its features. Standing by the headstone was as close to Millie Covington Simpson as I had ever been. I kneeled to photograph the headstone when I felt a warm glow surrounding me. The glow turned into a feeling that yes, this was the woman who had endured so much, yet returned to her Missouri homestead, becoming a much respected and admired member of the community. I settled in to focus on getting my picture, when, behind the marker, a figure slowly appeared. It was a woman in Victorian dress forming before my eyes. I struggled to see a face, but the image dissipated before her features were distinguishable. Shaking my head as I refocused on the headstone, I muttered to myself, Boy, you are going crazy. Once again on the highway, we fast approached stop number four on my journey. The stop is the deep hollow where Benjamin spent his last minutes on earth. After such an intense journey of discovery to that point, I was apprehensive about visiting the hollow. We turned left onto a small lane that marked one boundary of what, shall I say, is the small killing field. As we drove the lane down into the bottom of the hollow, we could see the home up on the edge of the hollow, just as described in the eyewitness account. Stopping, a familiar fog settled on the low ground. This time, I suddenly realized that I wasn't observing the field from the lane, but from up on the edge of the hollow. I had the realization that I was standing in the spot where young Henry Farrell had witnessed the murder of three men. I was aware of the movement of soldiers, or perhaps vigilantes, in blue uniforms, moving around myself and down in the field. 
A shiver ran up my spine. I observed as they led three men, which I know included Benjamin, onto the field. With desperate effort, I strained my eyes to see his face, but once again, I couldn't. A group in blue uniforms formed a line and raised their rifles. Just as I heard the roar of the guns, I was back in the car, my heart pounding. Shaking as I exited the car to document the area, I started taking pictures. I hear from the car my wife say, Why don't you ask if your grandfather is here? Intrigued by the thought of perhaps getting a response, I switched from picture taking to videoing. I asked Grandpa, Are you here? That was a bad day. I think I hear a voice in the wind, and I feel a chill up my spine. Playing back the video, just maybe the voice was there, but the recording was inconclusive. It was only a mile from the killing field to the last stop on my journey of family discovery. It felt a little strange pulling into the Dayton Cemetery entrance, as it was directly behind someone's residence. Fortunately, it had a rather long lane to the cemetery proper, giving some separation from the house. Following my sister's directions, we went to the approximate location of my ancestor's grave. I parked the car and began the search for the last resting place of Benjamin Simpson. Not knowing what the headstone looked like, the search lasted a few minutes. We found his headstone next to Mr. Grosshart, who had perished with him that fateful day. Fresh from my experience at the killing field, things felt relatively normal. We had a hard time reading the inscription at the bottom of the headstone, so we made a chalk tracing onto paper. It was when I stepped back to photograph the marker that the now familiar sensation of things are not normal began. I focused on the headstone, and once again, an apparition formed behind the headstone. This time, it was as what appeared to be a middle-aged man. His clothing was distinctly mid-1800s. I looked at his face, but it was being kept from me as if on purpose. I almost yelled aloud, Let me see your face. The apparition raised his arm and pointed a finger at me. I heard a voice very similar to my own immediate grandpa, practically a whisper in my head. The voice said, Grandson, you must tell the story of what happened here. The family needs to know their history. I blinked, and he was gone. Shaken, I completed documenting the headstone. Being thoroughly exhausted from the day's journey and the images I had seen, I headed for the car. Epilogue As my family research our ancestors, my holy grail is to find pictures of Benjamin and Millie Simpson. Someday, perhaps, someday, I will see the faces that elude me.